Okay. Well, my last talk on John Fisher is going to be about his defence of the priesthood and the mass against Luther. Of all Luther's works, Fisher insisted, none was more pestilential, senseless or shameless than the abrogation of the mass. In this book, states Fisher, Luther tries utterly to destroy the sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ, which the Church has ever held to be the most salutary and the chief object of devotion to all the faithful of Christ. Luther interpreted Hebrews 7.27 as teaching the sole sufficiency of the sacrifice of the cross, making any further sacrifice unnecessary. Therefore, the Mass cannot be a sacrifice, and as the function of a priest is to offer sacrifice, there is no ministerial priesthood set aside from the universal priesthood of all believers, and possessing powers denied to the rest of the faithful, that is, the powers to consecrate and absolve. Luther insisted that if you wish to be truly a Christian, be certain and never allow yourself to be moved from that certainty that there is in the New Testament no visible and external priesthood save what has been set up by the lives of men and by Satan. His theory of justification by faith alone ruled out any possibility of satisfaction for sin being obtained through the sacrifice of the Mass. Indeed, to term the Mass a sacrifice was for Luther blasphemous. The core of his case against the sacrifice of the Mass lay in his new theory of the sacraments, according to which the essence of a sacrament was a word of promise, that's a very important phrase, verbum promissionis, by which Christ assured forgiveness of sins to those who had faith in him, and thus in his words and promises. From this perspective, what mattered about the Last Supper were Christ's words. This is the New Testament in my blood, which shall be shed for forgiveness of sins. And the key word here is testament, uh, which Luther considers uh, passing on words, a will, a promise. On this, Luther based his claim that the Mass was not a sacrifice, but a testament, an analogy which expounded by casting Christ as a testator, bequeathing forgiveness to his heirs. All that was necessary was to believe in Christ's promise and accept his bequest. Faith alone attained the good offered by the Eucharist. Fisher upheld Catholic teaching on the Mass and the priesthood in his Confutatio, in his Defensio Regisationis, and the Sacri Sacerdoti Defensio Contra Lutherum of 1525, the defense of the sacred priesthood against Luther. In his De Abrogandum Missa Privata, the, the abrog abrogation of private masses of 1522, Luther had claimed that the priesthood of the New Testament was common to all believers and that the ordained ministerial priesthood of the Catholic Church, together with its sacrifice, the Mass, was a blasphemous abomination. In his Sacri Sacerdoti, Fisher quotes with indignation Luther's arrogant insistence that three arguments he had put forward against the sacred priesthood could not possibly be refuted. Luther had written, I am confident that by these three arguments every pious conscience will be persuaded that this priesthood of the mass and the papacy is nothing but a work of Satan and will be sufficiently warned against imagining that by these priests anything pious or good is effected. All will now know that these sacrificial masses have been proved to be injurious to our Lord's Testament, and that therefore nothing in the whole world is to be hated and loathed so much as the hypocritical shows of this priesthood, its masses, its worship, its piety, its religion. It is better to be a public pander, a robber, than one of these priests. It just baffles me how everyone in the Vatican thinks Luther is he's wonderful. The saintly bishop cannot contain his indignation at these blasphemies. <laughs> My God, says Fisher, how can one be calm when one hears such blasphemous lies uttered against the mysteries of Christ? How can one, without resentment, listen to such outrageous insults hurled against God's priests? Who can even read such blasphemies without weeping from sheer grief if he still retains in his heart even the smallest spark of Christian piety? Trusting, therefore, in the goodness of our Lord, we will in our turn try to launch three attacks against Luther 
by which, as with a sponge, we hope to wipe away all the filthy and blasphemous things that have proceeded from his mouth against priests. Fisher's indignation here provides a valuable insight into his character. When the time came for him to be insulted and subjected to outrageously unjust treatment, he exercised what must be described as almost supernatural restraint and humility. When the faith which he loved more than his life was attacked, he could show no such restraint. Despite his indignation at Luther's virulent attacks upon the most fundamental doctrines of the Catholic faith, Fisher, unlike Thomas More, never responds to the coarseness and vulgarity of Luther's polemic in kind. Luther's defenders excuse his vulgar language on the grounds that this was quite normal in the 16th century, even among the clergy. Monsignor Philip Hughes, England's greatest, greatest historian of the Reformation, considers this explanation too simplistic. He writes, In this matter of coarse language, is Luther an exceptional writer? Among religious leaders, certainly. Among the few who have claimed to be sent by God to restore the divine religion to its primitive state, he is uniquely coarse. Nor have I ever heard of anyone of these who even begins to approach him in this respect. And Germans of his own time, may no less zealous on the course of the Reformation, were shocked by this contradiction. Bullinger, for example, saying, some small excuse might have been found if it had been written by a swineherd and not a famous pastor of souls. In general, whatever the topic, once Luther is annoyed, say by contradiction, vulgar, filthy expressions simply pour out from him. Luther's foulness, this is still Monsignor Hughes speaking, Luther's, uh, Luther's foulness is not amusing, even when it is a foul joke told to encourage a despondent, anxious soul. The sheer witlessness of the filth is tedious in the extreme. Even his close friends dreaded the frequent occasions when he would give vent to his exhaustless abuse and unparalleled scurrility against the papacy, the church, and monasticism. Uh, Here's, a, here's an example of what Luther had to say. I will curse and scold the scoundrels until I go to my grave, and never shall they hear a civil word from me. I will tell them to their graves with thunder and lightning, for I am unable to pray without, at the same time, cursing. If I am prompted to say, hallowed be thy name, I must add, curse, damned and outraged be the name of papists. If I am prompted to say, Thy kingdom come, I must perforce add, Cursed, damned, destroyed must be the papacy. Indeed, I pray thus orally every day without intermission. One of his oldest friends felt obliged to conclude that Luther, with his shameless and governable tongue, must have lapsed into insanity and been inspired by the evil spirit. Monsignor Hughes considers the question of Luther's truthfulness to be of greater importance than his coarseness, noting that he never hesitated to lie if he thought it would be useful. He cites Luther's De Votis Monasticis, one of the more violent of his diatribes, as containing falsehoods which must have been known to be false to the writer. Perhaps the most notorious case of Luther's indifference to truth involved the double marriage of Philip, the Landgrave of Hesse. There are no grounds upon which Philip could obtain an annulment to his marriage with Christina, daughter of the Duke of Saxony, who had borne him seven children. Philip was infatuated with, infatuate with Margaret von der Salle, a 17-year-old lady-in-waiting, and Luther advised a double marriage, which must be kept secret to avoid a scandal. So, uh, he, he married this girl, and it was all kept secret, but news of the marriage eventually leaked out and caused a national sensation and scandal. Luther insisted that for the sake of the Christian church, Philip must deny that the second marriage had ever taken place. <laughs> this is a, I, lo I love this quote. And he, he said to Philip, What harm could there be if a man to accomplish better things and for the sake of the Christian church does tell a good thumping lie? <laughs> uh. Luther did not even draw the line at blasphemy, claiming in 1532 that our Lord had been an adulterer before he died, and on three occasions no less. 
Christ first became an adulterer, John 4, at the well with a woman, because, they said, no one points out what he is doing with her. Similarly with Magdalene, and with the adulteress in John 8, whom he allowed to go so easily. In the Sacri Sacerdoti, Fisher displays the full extent of his scholarship, quoting profusely from the scriptures and the fathers of the church. Time and again he emphasizes that the argument from tradition is unanswerable. And you might remember from yesterday, Luther just dismissed the whole of tradition. Fisher writes, Whereas the truth of the priesthood is abundantly and unanimously witnessed to by all the fathers through the whole history of the church, and whereas there is no orthodox writer who is not in agreement, and no word of scripture that can be quoted against it, therefore all must clearly see how justly against Luther we claim the truth of the priesthood as the prescriptive right of the church. It would, this is still Fisher speaking, it would indeed be credible that when Christ had redeemed his church at so great a price, the price of his precious blood, he should care for it so little as to leave it enveloped in so black an error. Nor is it any more credible that the Holy Ghost, who was sent for the special purpose of leading the church into all truth, should allow it for so long to be led astray. Nor is it credible that the prelates of the church, who were so numerous even in the earliest period of her history, and who were appointed by the Holy Ghost to rule her, as we shall afterwards prove, should have been enveloped in such darkness through so many centuries as to teach publicly so foul a lie. Finally, it is beyond belief that so many churches throughout the various parts of Christendom, hitherto governed with such careful solicitude by Christ and his Spirit, and by the prelates appointed for the purpose, should now unanimously fall into an error so foul and a lie so ruinous, according to Luther, that it does an injustice to the very testament of our Lord. There can be no doubt, Fisher insists, that it is by divine institution that certain men are called and ordained to the special office of feeding, teaching, and ruling the flock, of offering the sacrifice of the altar, and of serving as mediators between Christ and the faithful. In his second rejoinder to Luther, he provides ten axioms to refute the heresiarch's assertion that there is only one priesthood in the New Testament, that of the priesthood of all believers. Luther claims that this priesthood is spiritual and common to all Christians. For all we who are Christians, that is, sons of Christ, the great high priest, are priests by the same priesthood as he, nor have we need of any other priest or mediator but Christ. <laughs> Fisher concludes his second rejoinder by summarizing his ten axioms, which are replete with quotations from the, father, from the scriptures and the fathers. These ten axioms he's going to summarize. He's already given each one in great detail with quotations from the scriptures and the fathers. We have now built up our ten axioms for the second rejoinder to Luther. The first shows that for six undeniable reasons, there must be placed over the multitude men to care for its interests. The second, that in fact Christ appointed such men to feed, govern, and teach the Christian flock. The third, that such men need a more abundant grace that they may the better discharge their office. The fourth, that in fact Christ did bestow such grace upon his, the pastors he appointed. The fifth, that these offices must necessarily be continued in the church until the last day. The sixth, that no one lawfully discharges such an office unless he be duly called, ordained, and sent. The seventh, that those who are legitimately appointed to such offices are undoubtedly to be believed to be called by the Holy Ghost. The eighth, that at the moment when they are thus appointment, appointed, they receive always the grace of the same Spirit unless they place a hindrance in the way. The ninth, that the Holy Spirit infallibly gives this grace at the performance of some external rite, that is, the imposition of hands. The tenth, that the pastors and priests so ordained by the imposition of hands are truly priests of God, and are offer sacrifice both for themselves and for their flock. From these axioms, which we have fully established from the Holy Scriptures, it is clearly proved that in the Church there are some functions instituted by Christ, and his Holy Spirit, which are not common to each and every one of the people. 
for not all are called to the office of feeding, teaching and ruling the flock. But with that call and ordination, as we have shown, no one may usurp these functions. We do not deny, however, that all the people are called priests in Holy Scriptures, but their priesthood in comparison with the other is metaphorical. For the people in the same sense in which they are called priests are also, as we shall show, called kings. Each one as a king rules himself, and in like matter is a priest to himself alone. All Christians then are kings and priests, but to themselves, not to others. But the pastors and priests of whom we speak are priests for the whole flock, in the sense that they feed and rule them. For they are mediators between Christ and the people, that they may teach the people what they have learned from Christ or his Spirit. For this reason does St. Peter, as we have seen, call Christ the Prince of Pastors. For as they feed the flock, they are in turn fed by Christ. Moreover, the priests of whom we speak have to render an account for the souls of their subjects. But the people, in their turn, have not to render an account for the souls of their priests. Again, priests, although they are taken from among men, are yet appointed for men in the things that appertain to God. But the people, on the other hand, are not appointed to act as intermediaries to God for their priests. Priests, therefore, being of the same flesh and blood as the people, are to offer sacrifice continually, both for themselves and for the sins of the people. Thus the victim, by which chiefly they are to appease the anger of God, is the sacrifice of the altar, in which, under the appearance of bread and wine, according to the order of Melchizedek, they offer continually the body and blood of Christ. Luther, with such a great show of words, boasted arrogantly that he had proved no priest nor mediator to be necessary to the people except Christ. It will now be clear, I trust, how utterly unfounded is this assertion. So may we say, too, of his assertions that every Christian is a sufficient priest to himself to teach himself and to perform all the other priestly functions and all other offices that are not common to the whole people, but have been set up by the lies of men and the deceits of Satan. For from the foregoing axioms it will be obvious to all that the office of these men, whom for the moment we may call go-betweens or mediators between Christ and the flock, was not established by any human invention, but by the divine institution of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Fisher's mastery <coughs> of patristic teaching is made clear in his response to Luther's claim that there is no priesthood in the New Testament beyond that of the general priesthood of all Christians. <coughs> Luther writes, Before going further, let us stop here a moment to hurl a few jibes at the monsters and idols of this world, the Pope and his priests. Come now, you fine priests, show us one jot or tittle from the whole of the Gospels or Epistles to prove that you are or ought to be called in any special way priests, or that your order is a priesthood different from the general priesthood of all Christians. Why do you not reply? Can you hear me, you deaf images? Go to the schools of Paris, I beg you, where in place of texts of scripture they issue their official degrees. Where do you come from, you priests of idols? Why have you stolen the name that is common to us all and appropriated it to yourselves? You are guilty of sacrilege and blasphemy against the universal church, for you have violently snatched from others a holy title, and now abuse it, turning it merely to tyranny, to ostentatious avarice and lust. Again, I say, we regard you priests as the idols of the world. What can you say for yourselves, you intolerable burdens upon the whole world? You are not priests, and yet you call yourselves such. Think what you deserve, you notorious thieves and hypocrites. Fisher replies, Surely no one who reads this will imagine that he is listening to a man of sane mind in Christian spirit, but rather to a mad dog spurred on by the furies of hell. But let him keep his abuse. We will proceed with our argument. And although the axioms we have above established are quite sufficient to answer this outburst of Luther's, yet we will add more. First, I would ask the reader to notice how unjustly Luther attacks the priests of the present day. For it is not true that they have usurped to themselves this name, nor imagined nor invented it now for the first time. For 
If any deserve to be attacked for this cause, it is rather those whom we have quoted above. Oregon, St. Basil, St. Athanasius, Eusebius, St. Cyril, Chrysostom, Cyprian, Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine, who were so blind that far from detecting the error which Luther now proclaims, they embraced it as the most evident truth. Still more should Luther attack Saints Ignatius, Polycarp, Clement, and Gregory Nazianzen, Dionysius, Hegesippus, Philo, Eusebius, and other men of their age, who, being contemporaries of the apostles themselves, should not have taught the church anything beyond what they had learned from them. But most of all, should Luther direct his insults to the Holy Ghost, who dwells in the church, being sent for this very purpose, that is, that he may lead it into all truth. Yet, the Holy Ghost, from the very earliest days of the church's history, allowed what Luther calls this pestilent error to establish itself, and with such great harm to souls, to be continued through so many centuries, until the present day in every church in Christendom. We cannot doubt that all the early fathers of whom we have spoken were inspired by the Holy Ghost. If then Luther is inspired by the same spirit, he would hold no other opinion than theirs, especially as they are so unanimous in their teaching and their words. Much more just it would be to attack Luther, who despises the fathers, and though they are so numerous, so renowned for their learning, so full of the Holy Ghost, follows the mad dreams of his own head. Luther insisted that St. Paul's teaching on the priest of all believers was incompatible with the Catholic teaching, that in the church there are teachers and the taught, the magisterium and the faithful, and there are those invested with the authority to command, and for others the obligation of obedience. The saint quotes Luther directly, where now, says Luther, is your impudent mouth, your cheek swollen out with blasphemy, as with the sea, belching forth with ungovernable pride? Where there is superiority, there is authority to command. There is for all others the obligation of obedience. Satan himself speaks through your mouth these mad words against Christ, speaking through Paul. Christ, by his divine authority, has made you and yours subject to all Christians, giving you the right to speak and to judge. But you in your effrontery make everyone subject to yourself, and arrogating to yourself alone the right of speaking and judging, raise yourself alone above all like Lucifer. All Christians then have the right and the office of teaching to the confusion of Behemoth and all his scales. The saint replies, All this is abuse and worthy of a reply. Unless there were in the church authority to command, St. Paul would never have said, Obey your prelates and be subject to them. Or again, let the priests who rule well be esteemed worthy of double honour. And again, treat with honour such as he is. Once more, we beseech you, brethren, to know them who labour among and are over you in our Lord, and admonish you that you esteem them most highly. Never does St. Paul command otherwise. And indeed, more than once he speaks of his authority and of the obedience others must give. For there must be in the church uh, a f superiority and the authority to command. And if such authority be granted to any, most of all it is proper for it to belong to the supreme pontiff. But Luther tries to sweep away all other authority that he may rule alone. For unless I am much mistaken... He desires just what he objects to in the Pope, the subjection of all to himself. Is not this the reason why he prefers the judgment of the rude and ignorant populace to the interpretations of the Holy Fathers? To him the judgment of the populace is of more weight because it approves his faction than the unanimous consent of the Holy Fathers because they entirely disprove all his dogmas. At this point the saint cannot resist a touch of humour. Although he had insisted that he would not descend to Luther's level of abuse, he could not resist turning Luther's abuse of the Pope against the heresiarch. If then one wishes to retort Luther's abuses upon him, one will find that they fit no one else so exactly as him. An impudent mouth, blasphemous cheeks, the belching of ungovernable pride, a tongue inflamed by Satan against Christ, speaking through St. Paul, 
the vomiting of mad words, the effrontery of wishing to subject all things to himself, an ambition greater than Lucifer's by which he tries to be raised up above the Pope and all the fathers, an immeasurable arrogance by which he shamelessly despises the judgments of all men, however holy or learned, in fine, like a veritable beer moth, he is covered by the impenetrable scales of deceit. But we have thought it right to abstain from abuse. <laughs> His observation that Luther arrogated to himself precisely the powers he did denied to the Pope is particularly perceptive. Luther, in fact, claimed for himself an authority to which no Pope has aspired and which is expressly denied to the Pontiff by all Catholic theologians, that of inerrancy. Where Luther was concerned, every comment that he made was inspired by, directly by God, and anyone who questioned the least jot or tittle of his teaching was self-evidently a tool of Satan. This brings me to the last of Fisher's four great treaties, uh, treatises against Lutheranism. He refuted an attack on the real presence by the Lutheran theologian Joanne uh, Joannes Oculampadius in his 220,000 word De Veritati Corporis et Sanguinis Christi in Eucharistia Adversus Joannem Lampadium, published at Cologne in 1527. Uh, he, this, by the way, Oculampadius, he's legendary among the Lutherans. He's a great and unanswerable scholar and humanist. Father Edward Serps describes this book as undoubtedly Fisher's theological masterpiece. Father T. E. Bridget considers it to be the most important of all Fisher's writings. A group of reformers led by Swingley insisted upon a purely symbolic interpretation of the words hoc es corpus meum, and Echolampadius attempted to impart credibility to this breach with the unbroken tradition of the Church and the teaching of Luther by a radical reinterpretation of the majority of Christian writers since the second century. So, unlike Luther, who just ignored the fathers, Echolampadius tried to show that the fathers is taught what Swingley taught. In his very scholarly work, Fisher pointed out the manner <coughs> in which Echolampadius systematically distorted patristic sources, a distortion which Richard Rex does not hesitate to describe as willful misrepresentation. Fisher documents the manner in which Echolampadius suppresses pages in the Fathers, such as Ambrose, which uphold the real presence. Then this, this great Lutheran scholar takes texts out of their context, in which passages immediately put for and after the one that he cites contradict his interpretations. He changes the words of the Fathers, <laughs> and this is almost unbelievable. He even inserts passages of his own into their works, with the object, Fisher states, of making lies shine like the truth. As well as pointing out the errors of Echolampadius, Fisher strengthens the faith of his Catholic readers by demonstrating the manner in which Catholic teaching on the reality of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist is proved by the most clear words of Christ, by his promises, by the teaching of the Fathers and the Councils of the Church, by innumerable miracles, by revelations worthy of credence, and the fact that those who reject this teaching cannot agree among themselves. The claim of Echolampadius that the words, this is my body, are purely figurative, did not correspond with Luther's doctrine of consubstantiation, in which the true body of Christ coexisted with the bread after the consecration. This was but one example of the serious divisions that were already appearing within the Lutheran sect. Luther had replaced the infallible teaching authority of the Church by his self-bestowed personal infallibility in, in interpreting the Bible. In theory, he conceded the right of every believer to do this. I quote him, In matters of faith, each Christian is for himself Pope and Church, and nothing may be decreed or kept that could issue in a threat to faith. But in practice, it was Luther's interpretation which must be accepted. He who does not accept my doctrine cannot be saved, for it is God's and not mine. Luther most certainly did not believe in universal freedom of opinion in religious matters. What he demanded was freedom for his own opinions, 
Those who disagreed with him, whether Catholic or Protestants, were dismissed as pig dogs, dolts, fiends from hell. His personal interpretation of the Bible was a saving truth. All else was lies and delusions. It is hardly surprising that some reformers who disagreed with him remarked sardonically that it was small gain to have got rid of the Pope of Rome if they were to have in his place the Pope of Wittenberg. Fisher did not simply take satisfaction in the divisions among the Lutherans. He states specifically in his refutation of Equilampadius that he exulted in these divisions. Yet, I'm um, quoting now, yet it was not even on account of this vengeance of God abandoning them to a reprobate sense that I exulted. There is a still more evident proof of God's avenging hand. It is related in the book of Genesis of certain men that they resolved to build a tower whose top should reach to heaven so as to leave their names famous to posterity. The world was then of one tongue, but God so punished their pride as to confound their speech, so that one understood not the other. The same punishment has fallen these factious followers of Luther. They also conceived in their minds that they would build a new church and get fame throughout the world. And in this endeavour it is wonderful how united they were and banded together, so that they seemed to be like one man, with one heart and mind. Nor would they have ceased from their work had not God, pitying his church, looked down from on high and bridled their madness by strife of tongues. He has brought it about that those who seem leaders among them understand not each other's voices. They strive with one another, and no one deigns to listen to his neighbour. The followers of Karlstadt have separated from the Lutherans, and they are pouring out insults one against the other. It may be seen from letters just printed in the name of Luther how great a controversy rages. Even Melanchthon, as I have heard from trustworthy men, is not well agreed with Luther. And now at length one of these reader, uh, leaders comes to the front, named John Ecolampadius, who formerly followed Luther in everything, and now he most vehemently differs from him in many points. Who then does not see that God is fighting for his church since he has put confusion in their tongues and turned their arms one against the other? Fisher's rep refutation of Ecolampadius had a considerable, even decisive influence on the teaching of Trent on the real presence. Fisher's books and sermons refuting Protestantism were read and quoted throughout Europe and translated into vernacular languages, including German, Hungarian, and believe it or not, Czech. Father Sertz writes, his orthodoxy, his learning, and his solidity made Fisher a pre tridentine classic. Even the failure of Luther and Ecolampadius to refute him served to enhance his reputation as being unanswerable. As I mentioned to you before, although Luther answered every attack upon him, he never attempted to answer Fisher, nor did Ecolampadius, when he wasn't in a position to, when Fisher had shown how dishonest he was. His confutation of Luther's defense, Assertionis Lutheri Confutatio, published in Amsterdam in 1523, went through 20 editions by the end of the century, twice as many as Thomas More's Utopia. The great Spanish uh, Dominican, Francisco de Vitoria, insisted that Luther was the only bishop in the church capable enough to join in the battle against the Lutherans. For the benefit of Father Barrero, I'm sure he'd like to hear uh, Vitoria's words. A solus unus episcopus es modern ecclesia, puto rofensis, vir magnae doctrinae qui scribet contra Lutheranos. And you can find this in the Commentarios a la Secunda Secunda de Santo Thomas, published in Salamanca in 1932. The German Catholic apologist Johann Eck came to England specifically to consult Fischer and drew heavily upon him in his own great work against Luther, Encuridium Locorum Communion, which was dedicated to Henry VIII and also contained material derived from the King's Book. Eck's Encuridium was published more than 100 times. Ioannis Cocleus also admired Fisher and translated parts of the confutation and the work against Ecolampadius into German. He maintained that Luther made no attempt to refute either Fisher or More 
because their doctrine was too sound and their lives too upright for him to attack. Cochleus also dedicated some of his own books to Fisher and after his execution wrote two books defending Fisher and More and denouncing Henry VIII. St. Thomas More attributed his own eventual conviction of the divine nature of the papacy to Fisher. Uh, for a long time, Thomas More wasn't convinced that, that the papacy was a divine institution. In a tribute to his fellow martyr, More wrote, The Reverend Father John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, a man illustrious not only by the vastness of his erudition, but much more so by the purity of his life, has so opened and overthrown the assertions of Luther that if he has any shame he would give a great deal to have burnt his assertions. As regards the primacy of the Roman pontiff, the same Bishop of Rochester has made the matter so clear from the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, and from the whole of the Old Testament, and from the consent of all the Holy Fathers, not of the Latins only, but of the Greeks also, I am moved to obedience to that see, not only by what learned and holy men have written, but by this fact especially, that we so often see that, on the one hand, every enemy of the Christian faith makes war on that sea, and that, on the other hand, no one has ever declared himself an enemy of that sea who has not shortly afterwards shown most evidently that he was the enemy of Christ and the Christian religion. I've already mentioned uh, about the, the extent to which Fisher's writing on justification and the real presence influenced the Council of Trent. He was one of the very few contemporary theologians to be cited in the debates on justification. His De Veritate can be said to have been used as a reference book for the debates on the real presence, and he can be considered the single most important influence upon the Council's decrees on the real presence, and the essential unity and identity of Christ's sacrifice on the cross with the sacrifice of the Mass. The key contribution to that council of the Jesuit Alfonso Salmeron hardly mentions any contemporary theologian but Fisher. He was also cited on scripture and tradition, penance, indulgences, holy orders and purgatory. Father Surtz writes apropos Fisher's influence on this council, his writings as a theologian and his example as a bishop and martyr are appealed to at intervals from beginning to end. So the Senate is just so sorry that he's more sad that he's almost completely forgotten. In a sermon preached in 1505, John Fisher had prayed for bishops who would be true shepherds to their flocks. Set in thy church strong and mighty pillars that may suffer and endure great labors, watching, poverty, thirst, hunger, cold and heat, which also shall not fear the threatenings of princes, persecution, neither death, but always persuade and think with themselves to suffer with a good will, slander, shame, and all kinds of torment, for the glory and Lord of thy holy name. In this passage he had, without realizing it, painted his own portrait, and prophesied in detail the sufferings that would precede, that would precede his martyrdom. The direct cause of this martyrdom was his refusal, like that of St. Thomas More, to subscribe to the 1534 Act of Supremacy, which effectively dethroned the Pope and substituted the King as the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England called Anglican Ecclesia. The section of the Act which made the double martyrdom inevitable reads, The King... Our sovereign Lord, his heirs and successors, kings of this realm, shall be taken, accepted, and reputed the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England called Anglican Ecclesia, and shall have and enjoy annexed and united to the imperial crown of this realm, as well the title and style thereof, as all honours, dignities, immunities, profits, and commodities to the said dignity of the supreme head of the saint, said Church, belonging and appertaining. It's the profits and commodities is very significant because, you know, as I explained to you, every bishop, the whole income from his first year had to go to the Pope, well now it had to go to Henry VIII, and everything you had to pay Rome for to get bulls, now you had to pay the king. Henry VIII would tolerate no dissent from anything he wished, from anyone for any reason. 
John Fisher had been chosen as a bishop by Henry's father, who recognised his manifest holiness, but that could not save him. He was not only the holiest bishop in Europe, but the entire Catholic world, but that could not save him. He had been revered by Henry's grandmother, Lady Margaret, and chosen to be her confessor, but that could not save him. He had defended Henry's book against Martin Luther, but that could not save him. He had preached twice at St. Paul's Cross at the express command of the king, but that could not save him. The king had so admired him that he insisted that the royal arms should be affixed to all the saints' books against Luther, but that could not save him. The saintly bishop is gravely ill and on the point of death, but Henry was merciless. The judgment passed upon the king in a contemporary account could hardly be more severe. More monstrous was it that the king or any man could be so cruel to put such a man to death, yea, though he had been an offender, for very shortly he must have died by nature. And surely, I think, if he had been in the great Turk's land and guilty of a great trespass there, he would never for pity have put him to death, being already so near the pit's brink. For it is the most cruel thing that can be to put to death anyone that is presently dying. Wherefore, in this point, I think this King Henry passed all the Turks or tyrants that ever was read or heard of. In a tribute to Fisher, in which he insists that the saint was the holiest bishop in Christendom, Cardinal Pole writes, What other have you, or have you had for centuries, to compare with Rochester in holiness, in learning, in prudence, and in episcopal zeal? You may indeed be proud of him, for... If you were to search through all the nations of Christendom in our days, you would not easily find one who is such a model of Episcopal virtue. If you doubt this, consult your merchants who have travelled in many lands. Consult your ambassadors and let them tell you whether they have anywhere heard of a bishop who has such a love of his flock as never to leave the care of it, ever feeding it by word and example, against whose life not even a rash word could be spoken, one who is conspicuous not only for holiness and learning, but for love of country. The martyr had once risen that to die well is man's chief and principal business. He meditated upon death and prepared himself for it throughout his priestly life. And lest that the memory of death might have to slip from his mind, he was always accustomed to set upon one end of the altar a dead man's skull, which was also set before him at his table as he dined or supped. St. John Fisher died in the faith and for the faith. No man could have died a more Catholic death. The executions of Fisher and Moore fill the world with horror. In a letter the French King Francis I, Pope Paul III, wrote, what shall we first mourn in such a wound of the universal church? The cause of his death is most to be lamented, since this most holy man laid down his life for God, for the Catholic religion, for justice, for truth, while he was defending not merely the particular rights of only one church, as St. Thomas of Canterbury formerly did, but the truth of the universal church. As Thomas of Canterbury died for the sake of the Catholic church in England, whereas uh, Paul III says uh, John Fisher died for the whole universal church. The Emperor Charles V declared that he would rather have lost the best city in his dominions than such a councillor as Thomas More. Erasmus lamented the deaths of the holiest and best pair of men England had ever had. In a sermon preached to the citizens of London during the reign of Mary Tudor, Cardinal Pole told them, and here now was the provision that God made to stay the multitude, that they should not so deeply fall, which was the example of these two great and notable servants of God, that rather suffer their heads to be stricken off than to consent that the realm should be cut off from obedience to the head that Christ did appoint upon earth. Dr. John Lingard comments, by these executions, the king had proved that neither virtue, nor talents, neither past favours, nor past services could atone in his eyes for the great crime of doubting his supremacy. In England, the news was received with deep but silent sorrow. 
in foreign countries with loud and general execration, but in no place was the ferment louder than in Rome. They had fallen martyrs to their attachment to the papal supremacy. Their blood called on the pontiff to punish their successors. On the 19th of May 1935, the Church ratified the common judgment of Christendom and raised the martyred bishop to her altars as St. John Fisher of Rochester. St. Thomas More was canonized on the same way. The two saints share the same feast day, the 9th of July. Father Edward Search wrote, Consequently, his death is, is his most influential work, written not by his pen, but spelled out in blood, for all to read as they run. Brendan Bradshaw writes, Suffice it to say that the barbarous act of executing the saintliest bishop in Christendom, already at death's door in any case, provided John Fisher with the opportunity of finally vindicating his conscience and contributed in no small way to settling the reputation of Henry VIII as the most contemptible human specimen ever to sit upon the throne of England. But Henry was by no means the most contemptible man in Britain on the day that the Bishop of Rochester mounted the scaffold in Tower Green. Far more contemptible than Henry were the dozens of bishops in England and Wales who betrayed their church and their God by groveling before the tyrant whom they had no hesitation in recognising as the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England called Anglicana Ecclesiae. A group of them, made uncomfortable by Fisher's refusal to join them in their apostasy, visited him in the Tower of London and begged him to bow to the inevitable and recognise Henry as both king and pope. He replied with words that, in my opinion, apply to many of their successors today. My lords, it is no small grief to me that occasion is given to deal in such matters as these, but it grieveth me much more to see and hear such men as you be, persuade with me therein, seeing it concerns you in your several charges as deeply as it does me in mine. And therefore methinks it had rather been all our parts to stick together in repressing these violent and unlawful intrusions and injuries daily offered to our common mother, the Holy Church of Christ, than by any manner of persuasions to help or set forward the same. We are besieged on all sides and can hardly escape the danger of our enemy. And seeing that judgment is begun at the house of God, what hope is there left? that if we fall, that the rest shall stand. The fort is betrayed, even of them that should have defended it. And therefore, seeing that the matter is thus begun and so faintly resisted on our part, I fear we be not the men that shall see the end of the misery. Wherefore, seeing that I am an old man and look not long to live, I mind not, by the help of God, to trouble my conscience and please in the king in this way, whatever may become of me but rather here to spend out the remnant of my old days in praying to God for him. I will conclude by quoting from the collect of the Mass of the Two Martyrs. O oh God, you raised up your blessed martyrs, John and Thomas, from among the English to be the defenders of the true faith and of the primacy of the Holy Roman Church. Grant that through their merits and prayers we may all become and remain one by the profession of the same faith. That's it.